Welcome to Charity Therapy, a podcast from Birkin Law about building better nonprofits. I'm your host, Jess Birkin. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Charity Therapy. Today, I am joined by Andy Sturdivant. Andy's a writer, artist, designer, performer, and beard aficionado <laughs> living here in, in uh, Minneapolis, where I'm at. Andy also works as the Artist Resources Director at Springboard for the Arts, and he's a coordinator for Minnesota Lawyers for the Arts. Welcome, Andy. Thank you. It's great to be here. I wanted to have you on the podcast, Andy, because, well, you're an artist and you work with artists inside and around the nonprofit sector. All true. In my experience, arts organizations can be a little unique among nonprofits because some are not nonprofits, some are nonprofits, and there's a lot of mm -hmm. mushy gray there, right? There is. So I've got a couple of arts related questions. Are you ready to just like jump right in? I'm ready. I'm. Uh, let's do it. This is what I do all day. So it's it's in some sense not much different than what I would be doing anyway. <laughs> well, ho hopefully this is more fun than regular work. Well, no, I mean that. I think it speaks well for my regular work that I enjoy it a great deal. <laughs> oh, so, oh, I like that yeah, version. So this is not. Yeah, no. There it's, you it's, go. It's, it's, it's really fun either way. Right on. Here we go. Okay, our first question. I'm a filmmaker, and I've been working on a huge project. I lived in a homeless camp on the edges of my city for a few years as a teenager. Now, I'd like to return to the camp and tell the stories of the folks who live there. I think a project like this could have a huge impact on my community, but I just don't have the money to fund this on my own. What's the best way to get funding for this project? Great. Very, very good question. Well, I should say, in my role as coordinator of Minnesota Lawyers for the Arts, it is the one of my key principles to defer to attorneys <laughs> <laughs> on some of these matters and to also preface anything I say by saying, I am not an attorney. This is not legal advice. And we will, if there is anything we can't figure out, we will get you on the phone with an attorney, which is what I would say. But I have an attorney on the phone now. So that's, that's great. A lot of the questions that I get from folks and a lot of the artists I'm working with are individual artists. They're, you know, they're self-affiliated. Maybe they're an LLC. Most likely they're a sole proprietor and most likely they are going out there and making the work themselves, you know, in a way that's kind of directed by their own artistic vision, their own interests. For whatever reason, people make art, you know, it's directed by those things. And so, yeah, this is a big question. I have a project. I need to pay for it. What is the, the best way to do that? The perpetual question. The perpetual question, yeah. And I don't know that there's a best way to do these things. I think there's good ways to do them. <laughs> it's just a matter of figuring out, I think, initially, how the person conceives of the project. Like, there's two interesting phrases in this question, as they have phrased it. One is they're a filmmaker. So they identify as a filmmaker. That tells me right there that the person is like, that's principally what they do. Either that's their job, that's their vocation, that's their avocation, that's their hobby. But principally, you know, they're making films, I would presume, and I would ask them, like, you know, do you identify principally as a filmmaker? And, and they would either say, yeah, I'm a filmmaker. I have a couple shorts I've been working on, you know, working on like a feature length. Or they would say, well, you know, my background is actually as a writer. You know, I've been involved in you know, maybe advocacy work for unhoused populations. And I think that making films is a good way to kind of continue that work. And so that right there, that's a kind of an interesting distinction right there. Um, and I think it, it kind of drives the way that they're going to want to approach the funding part of it. Because the other thing they say is this could have a huge impact on my community. And I think that's an interesting part too, because that tells me that, you know, obviously, you know nonprofits. People listening to this know nonprofits. Nonprofits have to have a couple different things, right? They have to have a nonprofit mission. There's always the mission focus. That's the the main part. And so if there's an aspect of of the impact on the community being, you know, notice they're not saying like this could be a huge artistic triumph, which is equally valid. And like yeah. it's not an either or situation. But the fact that there's a, a an idea of an impact on the community tells me, okay, maybe there is a way to approach this. That looks a little more non profit <laughs> Yeah. I wish we had this person here so we could ask it, them, right? Yeah, because it's like, yeah. though, these are, I love that you're drawing this out of this question because that's a, that's like so insightful, right? Like, 
who are you at base when you're doing this? Are you advocating or mm-hmm. are you like, this could win me an award as a mm-hmm. part of my filmmaking career? And both of those can be true and neither is bad, but it, it probably matters how you're going to get it funded and who's interested in funding this. Exactly. I mean, the reason why the nonprofit model looks attractive to artists is because, for better or for worse, for right or for wrong, it does unlock a lot of funding opportunities that are not available to individuals. And so there be, you can kind of see people doing a mental calculus, like, hmm, if there's these funding opportunities that are available to me as a nonprofit, should I be thinking in this way? And should I be, you know, trying to put artistic projects into that box? And and I don't encourage people to think that way because, you know, you can figure out ways to get things paid for. You don't have to go through the whole rigmarole of becoming a nonprofit oh, Lord, just Andy, in order preach. to. <laughs> for it's real, like, people. It's like so much harder than a regular business. It's not. It is. There's like this idea that if it's for charity, it's easy and mm-hmm. free. And oh, my goodness, that couldn't be less true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And I guess the, the kind of the question that I would ask this person here is, okay, let's say you make this film and let's say, let's even think about it like programmatically. Like, let's say the function is to raise awareness, to create like a wonderful artistic project, but also to raise awareness, to kind of create, you know, give voice to these individuals. So they think about it programmatically. If we were to say, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start a nonprofit, whether it's fiscally sponsored, whether they they work with somebody to to set up a 501c3, it's going to be called like, you know, Voices on the Margins or something like that. And it's a series. See, Andy, for your movie titling needs. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> that's like, well, that's the name of like the production company, maybe. You know, it's like that. that's the name maybe of the, the organization that is making these films. So let's say to this individual person, if you were to be kicked out of this project and you were to lose control of it, like, would that be okay? Oh, I, I love where you're going with right? this. Yes. Because the if the answer is, oh, absolutely not. This is my personal vision. This is like something that I'm born to do and, and like other people can do this and I want to help people, but I would like to be the person directing this. And that's great. That is why we're artists. Yeah. <laughs> we can direct or like, things. what if this made no money? Would you be cool with it just going into the world and being seen by lots of people, but you never saw a dollar from this? Yeah. And I think... You know, some artists are okay with that, but it almost seems like the control thing. Because if they say, no, this is a project for everybody. Like, if Mm -hmm. I have a board of directors and they've determined for whatever reason that I am not the person to lead this, I can step away and work on my own stuff. But this work, Voices from the Margins or or whatever we call it, will continue without me. And I think that's a really good, like, that's a way to say, okay, like, this is definitely not a nonprofit project if, if, you know, you want to retain control. Yeah. That's a huge deal for me in in almost any formation that I'm working Mm -hmm. with. It's like, how do you feel about, you know, losing control and giving up control? Because it's not just you that's going to be making Mm -hmm. decisions. Absolutely. Exactly. And I feel like with filmmakers in particular, I think that's why this is this question is really well chosen, because for whatever reason, I think with filmmaking is a discipline because there is such an advocacy and, and justice oriented aspect to it, or there can be those lines do get a little blurry. Right. For this person, I would say, if you want to make a film by yourself as an individual filmmaker, apply for an individual artist grant through like, you know, the Metro Regional Arts Council or the Minnesota State Arts Board. And that's going to get you the funds to do the stuff that you need to do to make this happen, you know, to pay for your own time, to hire the editor, to hire the director of photography, or, you know, you can crowdfund it. Like in a lot of ways, crowdfunding is a much quicker way <laughs> yeah. to raise a, a you know a fairly large amount of money without being beholden to the timeline for an individual grant which is a lot longer usually right. well and if they were let's just say this is very mission driven and they mm-hmm. were wanting to partner with a nonprofit it, i could mm-hmm. definitely see a model c fiscal sponsorship being a thing mm-hmm. but that the model c fiscal sponsorship is very specific, right? So yeah. like you have to find a nonprofit whose exempt mission is achieved by what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And then they have to be willing to take the risk and deal with the headache of managing mm-hmm. your project from a nonprofit perspective. And then, you know, you can direct fundraising efforts 
to have them help you raise donations mm-hmm. to fund the project. But I think the everybody thinks, oh, fiscal sponsorship, that's so easy and we'll get free <laughs> money because it's a charity. And, you know, you and I both know that fundraising is almost way harder than yeah. seeking an individual artist grant or crowdfunding yeah. because it's just a whole other ball game that you're not necessarily even trained in. Yeah. And it's, it's one of those things you can teach yourself, but yeah, I mean, the amount of, you know, one of the things they do at Springboard is run the job board, right? And there's a reason why there's development jobs all the time, right? Because <laughs> there's a need for it and it's difficult. You know, it's something you can learn for sure, but it's difficult work and it, it, um, you can really burn out on it. Well, and it's not easy to get people to part with tens of thousands of dollars. Well, yeah. You know, yeah. it's it, everyone thinks they're going to get five fifty thousand dollars donations and be <laughs> done with it. And it's like, yeah, yeah that's probably not how that's going to go. <laughs> yeah. So what would you think if this person asked you, would it be a viable way to go if they were to find a nonprofit that had the mission, you know, like, let's say a service organization that works with unhoused populations, is it the sort of thing where, where you could suggest to them that they might pitch it to the nonprofit as a programmatic aspect of their mission and raise the money for it through their development people, through their development infrastructure, and then hire the filmmaker as a contractor to execute the project? Well, that's definitely a creative and viable solution. I think the risk to the filmmaker is that control piece, right? Because mm-hmm. now you're not really you're not you're not making your movie right now you're making a commercial for their fundraising program that's and yeah what was what was the story you wanted to tell versus what does their upper management or their board approve of mm, you exactly, know now we've right. really lost the artistic element and every artist i mean my ex is a musician and that is like a nightmare to have somebody sort of standing over your shoulder and telling you, well, if you just made this part <laughs> a little longer, if you just cut out yeah. that one, you know, scene we don't like or, you know, eh, I think that could go poorly. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. It, it did say nothing. And, and actually, as I asked that, I'm realizing there's the work for hire aspect, too, which means you don't even really retain creative control well, over the finished. Well, that's part of the problem with the Model C fiscal mm. sponsorship, too, right? A yeah. lot of those times you are either giving a permanent license or the nonprofit is actually going to own or be mm. co-owner of yeah. the thing. So if there is some sort of return on investment, you're going to be splitting that with the nonprofit. A lot of the time. Yeah. And this is all goes clearly to say, I, this is why I think more foundations and more arts boards should, should just be offering grants to individuals. So there's not this temptation to kind of force some kind of artistic project into a nonprofit box just for accessing $20,000. Right. You know? We need to go back to the truly being a patron of the arts, you know, the, who are the people in Florence that paid for like Michelangelo or whatever? <laughs> yeah, the, the Medici. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure they were like some terrible mafiosas or something. But, well, but I that think story they murdered a bunch is of good. Pope, but yeah, <laughs> <It's> anytime <laughs> Pope murder gets involved, there's, right, there's right? some real, real problems with <laughs> oh, <laughs> the model. <geez. laughs> All right, let's move on to question number two. I'm a member of a small artists collective in my community. We're really just an informal group of eight artists who have been supporting each other for a few years now, pooling together resources to buy supplies, rent studio space to share, and occasionally put on an event to show our pieces. Recently, the idea has come up to formalize this and turn it into a nonprofit so we can get discounts and save money on our expenses. Does this work as a nonprofit? (laughs) <laughs> this is another really common question. This, for me, feels a little bit more like a, a, a good fit. Um, it's interesting when they use the word collective. And I think when people come to me with, with these kinds of questions, one of the things you want to talk through right away is like, the word collective doesn't really mean anything legally. Right? <laughs> it's like, you could call it a collaborative. You could call it a couple of different things. And you can find organizations that call themselves the so-and-so collective, and it can be a for-profit business. It can be a nonprofit business. 
it could even be a cooperative, you know, like a, a legal cooperative. I think that's the one exception where you can't call yourself a cooperative if you are not legally incorporated as a, mm, a cooperative. Mm-hmm. But, you know, again, I'll leave that to the, the cooperative attorneys. So, yeah, I mean, it, the, the question here would be, again, what is the nonprofit mission here? And, you know, I, I mean, just the kind of the creation of artwork for the benefit of a community can be a nonprofit motive. I mean, that can be a reason to incorporate as a nonprofit because, yeah, it it does create some opportunities for this group of artists. Well, you know, it's funny, the things that they actually want to do, they say they want to get discounts and they want to save money on expenses, and I'm not a hundred percent sure that you know going with a nonprofit model would do those things and no, maybe the way that they're thinking. I, they I agree. I think this is um, <laughs> this to me sounds very much like we think everything is free when you're a nonprofit, mm-hmm. and right. that's you know kind of on the on the business end of things. I hear a lot of like, but we can get Salesforce for free. It's like, well, that's, oh, yeah, who cares? Sure. Do you you need yeah, a, right, you yeah. need to pay a consultant to figure out how to use <laughs> Salesforce? So who cares if you have a free account? You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. exactly. It's like you know, we get a discount on QuickBooks through TechSoup, mm-hmm. which is great. And if you're doing accounting, mm-hmm. you need QuickBooks. But you're only if you're only doing accounting because you started a nonprofit that's now subject mm-hmm. to FASB one sixteen <laughs> and GAP when you could have just jotted all your stuff on the backs of napkins and takeout yeah. bags like oh, you know <laughs> i don't know that you're helping yourself yeah exactly i mean i think you know honestly the the, the reason why i think a lot of collectives or collaboratives or, or groups like this would start a nonprofit is again to access some of those funding streams you know and if you look at the state arts board grants that are awarded through you know, the community arts grants or some of the other ones or the MRAC grants that are awarded to organizations. A lot of them are collectives, you know, that fit this this model pretty closely. They're a group of artists that are doing some kind of work that, you know, maybe there's an earned income aspect to it, but most likely, yeah, I don't know. They're doing work that has some kind of a nonprofit aspect to it. And do you know if those are for sure nonprofit entities or are they just sort of nonprofit-y? Well, there, I mean, the, to, in order to get that funding for the State Arts Board or MRAC, and those would be the two that would be the big targets here, I guess. Yeah, they either have to be 501c3s or they have to be fiscally sponsored through an organization like Springboard for the Arts. I mean, because we fiscally sponsor, I think, over 200 organizations, and many of them are collectives of artists, whether they're visual artists or musicians. So to to be eligible for those funds, you you do have to be... You can't be a nonprofitee. You have to literally <laughs> right. be a nonprofit or at least be fiscally sponsored by, yeah. you know, either Springboard or someone else. I've certainly had plenty of uh, collectives of friends that were artists that were just broke. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, it is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, they might have felt like they were a nonprofit. Yeah, that's the, isn't it fun to explain that? Like nonprofit doesn't mean you don't make money. It doesn't mean you right. don't make a profit. It means it means something else. But that's, yeah. you know, that's our job to kind of explain that. If these folks came in and were talking to me, some of the things I would want to know mm-hmm. would be, is this a closed group? Mm-hmm. Like, what is the mission? Because what's yeah, not exactly. really in here is what is the mission? There's right. a lot of, like, we help each other pool resources mm-hmm. and we share studio space and we mm-hmm. want to save money on our expenses. But what I'm not seeing is what is our public benefit? Right. right? And yes, art making art for people to see is a public benefit, but it doesn't say like, I wish this question had more information about mm-hmm. what they do to serve the public because they may not qualify. Yeah. And the, I, the IRS is very stingy, oh, sure, especially when it comes to arts groups where it seems like maybe there's just a bunch of private benefit mm-hmm. and people are just trying to use it as a tax loophole. Right. So if I were doing like an application with this person, it'd mm-hmm. be like, okay, tell me about your mission. What do you, how do you serve the public? How is that done at like low or no cost? If the answer mm-hmm. is, well, we have shows and we sell our art. That's yeah, that's not going to cut it. It's like, oh, wait, <laughs> that's actually a business. That's, yeah. that's not a charity. No, I guess if they have 
you know, if, if part of their mission is to like, you know, bring work by emerging or underrepresented voices, you know, to a larger audience, yeah, that feels more like it. And maybe, yeah, I don't know. It's the, it's the fact that they're a collective, like, it's like you said, is it a closed group or is it the kind of thing where they're partnering with other artists for exhibitions? They are working with, you know, schools. And like, is it anyone could join, right? right. Is this a member-based organization? Is it, or is it just like, no, me and my six friends and that's it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, that that's, those are some of the questions I would want to know like what what does collective mean to you because like you said it doesn't have any legal Mm -hmm. significance right so it's like what is that is it an inclusive community where we try and bring as many people under the umbrella as possible or Mm -hmm. we're you know bringing in like BIPOC women or like some Mm -hmm. you know something or is it just like well really you know we're all kind of in business together and we wish there was a way to do that free. <laughs> this is a common kind of, this is one that comes up a lot and I'd, I'd be very interested to get your perspective on it. So yeah, clearly maybe this is a, a commercial, I mean, this is a, a for-profit enterprise, you know? It could be. It could be, could be, but maybe they have some aspects some, because it's a programmatic thing usually, you know, they have a programmatic thing where the eight of them, they have maybe this dedicated space where they show work by, like you said, BIPOC women artists, for example, you know, is it the kind of thing where they could create either a fiscally sponsored project or a nonprofit that would be a project of this larger group, but would be eligible for, you know, for example, a community arts grant through the state arts board or something like that? For something specific, that's like a programmatic thing that we're doing right now. And Mm -hmm. whether or not the rest of what we do is commercial enterprises, who cares, right? Yeah. I think an interesting example of this is there is a, um, studio called Font Love Studio that does letterpress in Minneapolis. And it's run by a woman named Alana Schwartzman. And she, you know, she does letterpress, you know, commissions, like whatever kind of work is is coming to her. And in addition to that, she also has a nonprofit called Proof Public that is specifically about kind of bringing this technique to people that don't typically, you know, get to use letterpress as a, you know, a Mm -hmm. medium for you know, either kind of political work or for for yep. public facing work in some kind of way, and so it's you know it's a Lana in both cases, but it's uh, well, it's you know. Lana and a board in one, right? Exactly, <laughs> yeah, exactly, right. It's a Lana and it's a board, which is a very important distinction. And she would, I think, uh, that you're hitting on something really important there because there are things. So, like, not to get political, but in mm-hmm. the sort of like women's health, reproductive health, abortion care space, mm-hmm. right? A lot of clinics that are in that space are not Planned Parenthood. They're not nonprofits. But there are aspects of doing that work that's very mission focused. Mm -hmm. And there are aspects of that work that's like it doesn't it's not a viable part of a business. Like Mm -hmm. to take time out of your practice to train new doctors out of med school on how to do some of the procedures Mm -hmm. is just not something that pays. But it's Mm -hmm. important. And if you believe in the right to choose, then you need people to do that. So I think there are things like I'm hearing the letterpress thing and I'm like, oh, right. Like if there's like a dying art or craft or some of the folk art schools around where it's like we need to preserve or think Mm -hmm. about, you know, Lakota language and these sorts of things where it's like, well, there could be like a business aspect to some things. But there's this preservation, transfer of knowledge, getting education out there that as a, an artist business, it's like that's never going to make you money, but it's super important and people yeah. want to support it. Exactly. And so sometimes there's that happy medium where you can have a viable career and not have to have a board hire and fire you. Exactly. And still find a charitable outlet for those things that really like aren't good business, but people want to support them because they are meaningful and important. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, I mean, these are the, these are the kinds of questions that we want people to have with attorneys and with people that um, you know kind of know these structures and can help think through the the pluses and minuses. If this question right. came to me, you know, often it's phrased as a cooperative question, and 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 I've I've had a lot of trouble with that over the years. It's it's because uh, people will say, you know, could we become a cooperative? You know, like the wedge or like the Seward Co-op or like the Tilsner. I know I don't know if the Tilsner is a co-op anymore, but there's a few 
housing cooperatives for artists in Lower Town. And that is an extremely complex. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I'm like, water. don't look at me. That's yeah, it's not like, what right. I do. Yeah, this is not, it's not a lot of people that do this. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, yeah. I think, I don't know. It's, it's, well, and then you trade, there's a trade off, right? Yeah. Everything's a trade off. So, co op, you know, has different rules than a 501c3 public mm-hmm. charity. So, somewhere in there, you make a choice strategically. And I think maybe that's kind of like one of the takeaways here, actually, is Mm -hmm. that, you know, you really need to understand all your options and ask people like you or like me to really weigh out the pros and cons of like the direction, the strategic direction you want to go with something Mm -hmm. when you're forming or making that at this like pivot point, because the choice you make dictates a lot of downstream stuff later. Yeah, exactly. So I think that's a big takeaway from these questions is like, you have to pick a lane and the lane you pick is going to dictate a lot of your realities going forward. So Mm -hmm. it's really important to know what those realities are going to be and that you're okay with them. Exactly. And then I think another thing that you brought up that I love is like getting clear about who you are, yeah, who you serve. Are you fundamentally a filmmaker or are you fundamentally an advocate for the unhoused, right? That's like important self-study that people need to do when they're thinking about these things, because I think it does help you pick which lane you're going to go in, Mm -hmm. right? And then if you are thinking about a nonprofit, I would say like the final thing is remember like what is the public service? Mm -hmm. There has to be some sort of like public service and just you selling your art isn't a service to the public. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so we got to flesh out, you know, what that is if it is going to be a nonprofit. Exactly. Or, you think that pretty much sums it up there? That sums it up. I mean, these are all reasons why, you know, this is something I tell people all the time. Like, an attorney is not someone you call when you're in trouble. And I mean, you do call an attorney oh, when yeah. you're in trouble. No, but please you wanna, call way you, before that. Yeah, you want to, <laughs> yeah, you want to get on the ground floor early, you know, get someone involved. And that's, I mean, that's a lot of what I do is just kind of ideally breaking down that, that kind of perceived barrier that people have when it comes to talking to attorneys. Like, you can, you can talk to someone uh, early on, yes. you know, get the information yes. you need, make the decisions, and continue to work with that person. Yeah. I love that you provide that, the conduit, because lawyers are scary and you're not scary. Well, some so. of them are. <laughs> some of them are. <laughs> well, you know what I mean. People I do, are I afraid exactly of lawyers in general. <laughs> oh, Andy, thank you so much for joining me. My uh, pleasure, Jess. Thank you. Wonderful to have you here. I, we should definitely do this again. Be happy to. It's great. Really fun. Right on. Well, folks, if you enjoyed this episode, do me a huge favor, share it with a friend, rate, review, and subscribe on your podcast app. It really helps me out. If you have a question or a story to share, I'd love to hear from you. Send me a note online at charitytherapy.show. Thanks for listening. All right, folks, that's our show. Be sure to follow me on Instagram or Twitter at Jess Birkin. We want to hear from you. Send us a message at our website, charitytherapy.show. And don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at birkinlaw.com slash sign up. Charity Therapy is a production of Birkin Law Office, PLLC. Our theme song is by Whalehawk. And remember, folks, this podcast is produced for your entertainment and is not a substitute for actual legal advice.